All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started here today. And I'd like to welcome everyone to our Gopher May Gopher Solutions webinar. And uh, my name is Jesse Staff. I'm going to be the moderator for today's webinar. And it uh, looks like we've got a good group of folks that have joined us in the past. And if you're completely new to the webinar series, the Gopher Solutions webinar series is a uh, group of webinars that are focusing on a variety of physical education subjects and topics. And past webinar topics have included PE teachers presenting on specific activities like assessment, fitness, classroom management, and PE advocacy. And some of the past presenters we've had have included Dr. Robert Pangrazi, Dr. John Medina, and Jean Blades. And our presenters have done a really great job of bringing useful topics and information to the field of physical education. And the webinars will almost always occur on the third week of the month. And I uh, just wanted to remind everyone that everybody included in today's webinar will receive a certificate of participation for one hour of educational credit. And uh, also everyone that's Included in the uh, webinar today are going to be entered to win the, the prize at the end of the webinar. So hang tight with us. Today's prize is the Assess Pro Repetition Push-Up Tester. And uh, towards the end of the webinar, we're going to be making that announcement. So hang with us. And uh, today's webinar um, is titled Technology and Physical Education. This is actually part two of a webinar series that uh, we did with Dr. Lisa Witherspoon. Um, she did part one last month. She's back with us here today. And before I introduce Lisa, I wanted to mention that you will have a chance to ask questions as we go along here during the presentation. And they're only visible to me, the moderator, so feel free to um, type those questions. You'll see that on the right-hand side of your screen. As uh, we go, I'm going to be collecting the questions, and we will have a time uh, towards the end of the webinar for a Q&A with Lisa. So type those questions, send them to me. I'm going to collect them, and I will definitely bring those up at the end. And uh, Lisa will address uh, any questions that you might have on her topics. So. I've got Lisa's uh, very humbling resume and credentials in front of me, uh, just to give you an idea of who she is and where she's been. I've got the, the pleasure of introducing our presenter. Uh, Lisa is an assistant professor at the University of South uh, Florida, and she is in the Department of Teaching and Learning. She is in the Physical Education uh, Program uh, she serves as the director of the USF Active Gaming Research Laboratories and is an international expert on the subject of technology-driven games and exercise with a grounded passion in using technology to reach children in the 21st century. In addition, she serves on national committees and advisory boards related to phys physical education, technology, active gaming, sports and fitness concepts. She also serves on the PE Central Active Gaming Managing Editor and has been elected as an inaugural iTeach Fellow at the University of South Florida to assist future teachers and current faculty in using technology in the classroom. Dr. Witherspoon is in the Virginia Tech University Hall of Fame, the Catawba Valley Hall of Fame, the Newton Conover Hall of Fame, and she was inducted into the ACC Legends class of 2011 for women's basketball. She has designed and implemented various basketball camps all over the country to help young athletes acquire the foundational skills necessary to feel confident and competent to progress in movement development, and her continued passion to meet generations where they are in terms of interest and desire in order to help guide individuals in gaining and, and maintaining physically active lifestyles. So that was uh, quite a mouthful there, Lisa. I'm going to turn it over to you, and uh, you'll have the reins from here. Thank you so much, Jesse. And welcome back, those of you that were with us for the, the first part of technology and physical education. And those that you, of you that are joining us just for the second one here, um, and like Jesse had mentioned, 
I, I don't do a great job of, of looking at the questions while I'm talking, so uh, it's not that I don't feel like answering the questions, it's just we'll get to those questions uh, towards the end at the, of the presentation. Uh, during the first part of our technology and, and physical education webinar, we really just uh, dove in and talked about the fact that society, both adults and children, are faced with dealing with technology on a, on a daily basis. And there's many forms of technology in physical education. It's not really just one particular um, app or program. It could be looked at in terms of different ways of delivering presentations, delivering your curriculum, uh, assessment strategies, behavioral strategies, et cetera. Um, and as well, we also discussed the fact that based with the NASB standards, our national standards, and a lot of, quite a few of state standards, they're actually requiring quality physical education programs to be incorporating technology into your classroom at, at this point. We also briefly discussed four, four big overlarging categories of technology. We talked about extra gaming or active gaming. We talked about gizmos and gadgets, which are more like your pedometers, accelerometers, and heart rate monitors. Uh, we touched on apps that deal with tablets and smartphones, and then we talked a little bit about brain breaks. Uh, and I had also mentioned that we'll be discussing those further in webinars in the future where we break down each of those categories. So if you have a particular category that you're very interested in and want to learn more about, stay tuned to those webinars. I feel like those will be very informational and beneficial for you in the future. The last thing we really focused on was really talking about how you plan with technology and the fact that when you, you are using any kind of technology, you're using it as a, a modern jump rope. So basically looking at it as a, a regular jump rope or another piece of equipment because it's just really helping us as teachers accomplish our, our curriculum objectives. And then we talked about how it also should focus on still allowing us to, to assess our students to make sure they've accomplished those objectives. So moving on to today's presentation, um, I, I love this picture because when I first started in this nine years ago, ten years ago, this is, this is what I felt like. And I have so many teachers that really have talked to me and they're like, we don't even know where to start. So I hope if there are some of you that feel like this, um, you'll, you'll get a better understanding today on, on what we're going to go through and, and how, how this might help you um, because, once again, it is a common struggle for teachers. There are so many options and, and different ways of incorporating uh, a variety of technologies into your classroom, regardless whether you're elementary or secondary. Um, we're going to really focus on what to consider. And I, I think a, a major problem that I have experienced over the 10 years are teachers that just pick things because they look fun and they might seem cheap, and then they really don't help their classroom at all. They actually cause chaos. So we'll talk about those. Um, and then, as I had mentioned earlier, our future webinars will really break down the different categories uh, more specifically. So this is a, a picture of a, a physical education classroom, and the thing about webinars, I can't see all of the attendees' faces, but some of you probably have a lot of different things going through your head, like, wow, that's a lot of equipment. You know, how do they have the money to, to buy that, or it, it, it's very organized, or where are they going to put anything else that they buy? And these are all the things that we have to go through as teachers when we start to think about adding to our classroom. So the four components of our, our conversation today, we're going to talk about with technology choosing quality versus quantity. We're going to talk about the cost effectiveness of, of the technology that you would consider. We're going to talk about space allocation. And then really what is the benefit of, of why you're choosing the technology. And at the very end, I, I will go through some ideas of some financial um, opportunities and ways of earning um, money and finances to afford some of the technologies that might, you, you might think are out of the range for you. So let's first start with quality versus quantity. Number one, more is not better. And quite a few times, even principals, they're offering money to teachers 
or you're looking at something and the first thing you think is, I can get more of these so more students can use it, that's not necessarily better. Uh, you have to make sure that the, the equipment is durable. The last thing you want to happen is to buy a bunch of something that does not work and end up not being able to use it and it be a waste of money. So more is not always better and other considerations we'll talk about will help us with this category as well. Um, station work for developmentally appropriate practices. Quite a few times teachers don't really have the money to purchase technology and even a simple app or something they use with an iPad, they will use it as a station or an active gaming piece of equipment such as Dance Dance Revolution or Nintendo Wii. They may only have a few students active, so they'll use it as a station within a lesson that's accomplishing the same learning objectives. So that's another thing that we talk about. Um, even though all of the students may not be able to use the technology, using it in station work and breaking it down is a very effective option for the students and for the teacher. Um, technology is going to break down. Bottom line, we're going to have issues with phones, computers. I briefly mentioned this in part one. So we just want to make sure that what you're buying is durable and it is of quality and not something that you're just putting out there because it looks cheap and fun. And the last one is the free apps versus the, the, the cheap apps. There are quite a few apps out there where teachers can look into those and, and once we get into tablets and really start going through apps, it's, it's extremely informational. There are quite a few free apps that are great but there's also some apps that are 99 cents to $1.99 that are so beneficial. It makes your life easier as a teacher. It, it lets students learn independently, and they are very effective, and they can really hone in and teach what you're trying to get across to your students. So with that first section, you know, really looking at the quality of the technology you're choosing versus the quantity or how much of it you're getting. So that leads into cost effective. So multiple purposes. And what I mean by multiple purposes, you don't want to purchase and spend money on a technology that you're going to use one time. And there's quite a few different technologies, whether it's the apps you purchase or the active gaming equipment you purchase that can be used for one purpose and one purpose only. So if you're spending money and trying to think of how you're going to spend your funds, you want to make sure that you're able to incorporate that technology in multiple ways in your curriculum. And one example of that, I had teachers that when Nintendo Wii first came out, they went absolutely bananas over uh, you know, putting this in and using it, and I was helping them understand they needed to use it with stations because they had the remotes and only two could play at the time. And the, the number one problem were the batteries whether the students would leave the batteries on, they wouldn't turn them off, or the teachers forgot to turn them off, they were constantly having to replenish batteries. And most of you know, even in the household, and those of you that have kids, it's buying toys with batteries is kind of one of those things that you cringe at. It's like, oh no, I'm gonna have to have extra batteries. So think about that in school, when you have all of your children all day long, and having to replenish those quite often. So making sure you understand what you're purchasing might seem cheaper, but if it comes with the extra the strings attached to it, such as batteries, that sometimes is a hassle as well. Space allocation. And a lot of this is more for the active gaming equipment. Um, there is Hop Sports that has a, a huge system as well, but being able to store it in that first picture I showed of that storage room, this, this becomes a problem. So some of the equipment with active gaming actually needs permanent space. It needs to be planted on a wall, or it needs to have some sort of place to put a, a television screen, or, or something to where it, it doesn't move around. You're going to have, if you have um, exercise bikes that are hooked up to televisions, they're stuck unless you're going to plan on moving them in and out of your space and then trying to figure out where to store those things. So that's one issue that we have with technology that you must consider. And even though you may know it fits great in your curriculum, you've got to solve those problems before you spend the money on purchasing that material and that, those technologies. 
Um, a rolling cart has been something that I've used in my labs and also help teachers with the simple rolling carts that you see in your schools probably every day. You can sit a TV monitor on those carts and you can have your gaming system on the bottom and you can use that to roll in and out. And if you have a simple place to put that at the end of the day, that's another option to where it can be used on multiple occasions, but it doesn't have to be left in one area. So the last question is really the most important. What is the benefit? And it goes back to, is it fun? Is it enjoyable? That's not your purpose as the teacher. That's a by factor. Your main purpose is, is it going to teach the student something? Is it going to help my life as a teacher? Is it going to be more effective and more efficient for me teaching? And are the students going to learn what I'm expecting them to learn? And going in on that, maximizing time, once again, using it as stations, or if, if that's what you can do in your curriculum, that's good, but you want to make sure you're not purchasing something and expecting an entire class to be involved if that's not the way the technology can be used to maximize participation. Independent learning. There are quite a few apps out there where teachers are able to show the app get the kids in their stations or when they come around to that station, the students can learn independently through watching videos or through, you know, um, someone talking and, and showing them how to do certain things. So there's quite a few apps out there that will increase and, and expect student learning to be occurring. Does it reduce behavior issues? There are quite a few technologies, once again, where you can ex expect your students to really take advantage of the fact that they're able to use these technologies and it will keep them busy, it will keep them on task, and they won't be waiting in line, they won't be arguing and fussing, they'll all be engaged. And so those, those are some, you know, one of the main important parts, especially in elementary, uh, that I find if there are certain technologies that are used that just happen to be fun, the students tend to argue. Um, and, and, and fuss over those technologies. So making sure it's going to reduce behavioral issues and not increase them. And then the last thing, of course, and, and very importantly, the safety considerations. Choosing uh, equipment to where when you set the equipment up or when you use it, it is going to be safe. Uh, a lot of active gaming and extra gaming equipment comes with cords and plugs, so being able to set it up and creating a safe zone where students understand uh, how they're moving around the equipment is very, very, very important. So now we can talk a little bit about the financial constraints. Um, I, don't, I don't know many physical education teachers that walk in to a school year and have the funding that they feel like they need or that they feel like they're appreciated for the job that they do. So we're, we're all in the same boat here. I have worked with quite a few teachers, and I've also learned quite a bit from teachers on, on how they've been able to raise and maintain money in their accounts for purchasing equipment, and at this point, purchasing quite a few different types of technology methods. Um, one is obvious to, to many, it's grants. Um, you can go through Gopher and get, get opportunities for grants there. You can simply Google Physical Education Grants 2016 or whatever year it happens to be in, and it will come up with quite a few options of grants that you can obtain for your physical education program. Many teachers don't understand that in their district there is someone there that can help guide them and assist in, in writing grants for the program. So being able to reach out to whoever the health and wellness individual is in your district uh, would be important if you were interested because I know uh, our undergraduates do not go through a grant writing process. So when they get out into the schools, they feel uncomfortable. They, I, I didn't feel comfortable when I got out of my undergraduate uh, writing a grant. I, it was scary. But there are individuals that can assist you. Uh, to be able to go after some of the grants that you feel would really help your program. Community access, fundraisers, being able to reach out and do these fundraisers 
And I put you can do it because some of the most simple fundraisers for physical education programs here in Hillsborough County have come right in their PE programs where they might have pedometers and they purchase little pedometers um, or have them and they've done a, a step program for one day and the kids get to log their steps and they've gone out to their, their parents and they might give a penny for every step or two pennies or, you know, five cents, however, and all of that money comes back to the program and, of course, they give out little prizes to those that step the highest or have the highest step count. Um, that's one where if you have pedometers uh, and, and you can purchase pedometers um, pretty inexpensively um, as, as well. So that's a fundraiser if you have those. We do the turkey trot where once you get it set up, at the beginning of the year where the kids just come out during their, their regular class time or 30 minutes for one day. They come out and they run laps or jog or walk, the, the same kind of situation, and then the money comes back to your PE program. We had a very experienced teacher um, host a field day, and she had a um, icy machine, a snow cone machine, and she charged the kids 50 cents to have an IC made, and she had funded every piece of equipment for her field day over a four-year period. So it's little things of that nature, and of course the parents volunteer, that uh, allow you to be able to bring in funding outside of what you're provided by the school if you really you know, hone in and, and decide to put in the initial work to it. And I will definitely be able to help or would be glad to help any of you that are interested in any of these fundraisers. There's quite a few that you can do with your school. And then the last is the PTA. And depending on your PTA and where, who you're with, I've had a couple of physical education teachers since they've graduated our program that did not think their voice would be heard with the, the PTA. And sure enough, they were able to obtain uh, a new playground set of equipment, they're able to, you know, get new basketballs for their middle school uh, physical education program, and the PTA would actually put together some of these fundraisers. So being able to reach out to the PTA, if you get lucky and there's some parents on there that really want to back physical activity, then they really will do a good job in helping you find, find that funding in one way, shape, or form. And my favorite quote, and I actually made it up, Ten-year-olds will be ten-year-olds. The way they play and learn may change. So ten-year-olds are always going to be ten, but what we've noticed is what they're interested in, what they're able to adapt to very quickly is definitely different today than it was ten or fifteen years ago. So we need to understand as teachers that that's very important for us to continue to try to figure out ways to get them excited about being in our physical education program, especially those students that don't really like physical education or feel uncomfortable moving their bodies. And after all, we're really the only program in our schools where children will say we get to play in school only in physical education. And so we've got to allow them to not get to a point where they feel like physical education is boring because it's mainly repetition of everything's traditional, but trying to find things that get them excited about it to where they still feel like they're playing and being active but being healthy at the same time. So in conclusion of what we talked about today, uh, technology is definitely overwhelming. Um, there, are, there are many choices to consider. But going through what we talked about, really it's about making sure you're making the right decisions when you're considering a, a specific type of technology. And it is baby steps. And if it is overwhelming, start with something that you read about or you know is going to help you, you know is going to work, and the more comfortable you get with understanding how students are reacting, then you can continue to add to your program. And remember, as I put here, children are as good at, at this as we are. And yes, when things break down or when you put an iPad in front of them and you show them an app, they know how to swipe. They know how to click. They, they know how to, to move forward. And they probably will figure out more 
important things about the app than, than we can. When things break down, they're going to first look at plugs and they're going to flip through stations. They understand it. They really do. So we have to give them the benefit of the doubt that this may not be as difficult using with our students, regardless of the age, as we may feel like it is because we were brought up with it. So to finalize um, in future webinars, um, we will, I will discuss completely um, the breakdowns of the varieties. So I will have a webinar um, strictly on apps, um, and then I'll go further into extra gaming, and then we'll talk about some gizmos and gadgets and, and go from there. So I really appreciate everyone listening. If you have any questions, uh, please now would be the time to, to let us know. I'll be happy to help. Thank you, Lisa. A lot of good information in there. And uh, I did have a couple questions, and you mentioned you were going to get into this in some future webinars, but I think all of us are pretty anxious to hear what you're using, um, what your favorite apps and uh, games, technologies, and maybe we can break those down into three. So if you could just give us a, a few apps that you really love, that you use, that could be really helpful in the classroom. Um, could you maybe expand on that a little bit? Oh, that's, that's complicated. I probably use about 30. And once <laughs> again, it goes, well, I've been doing this for, for 10 years, so it, it really depends on the content I'm teaching. And with my teachers, the different position I'm in from the teachers that I'm, I'm probably talking to right now and talking with is the fact that I, I really think that I am preparing my teachers so when I'm teaching a lesson preparing them how to teach, I try to use apps that they could possibly use in their classroom. So I, I teach very differently than what you all would do in the classroom. So I use presentation modes for an app. I, I use one and I purchased it, um, Explain Everything. Uh, it's a, it, it, it becomes like a whiteboard on your screen where I can take my finger, I can drag, I can upload videos, I can upload pictures, I can draw on things. It's incredibly amazing. I use that for a, a lot of my presentations just to avoid PowerPoints. Um, I use Prezi PowerPoints. I actually require my students to use a different presentation mode and when they're delivering presentations, so they are used to doing that when they graduate. Um, I use Class Dojo with my students. Um, some of you might have heard of Class Dojo. It's a great way, especially um, more focused elementary, but if they're my students, when they're in class, I have, you can put in behavioral issues or positive things, and you can just click on it, and it'll give them points. Um, and then actually with the, the, the student's parents, you can directly send an email, and it'll show if someone was off task today, you can add comments, you can send it right to them, so you're able to keep that communication without having to go in and send a separate email or a phone conversation with the parents. Uh, so we use that one. I use Team Shake uh, to get my kids to understand different ways of partnering, partnering up their their students. Um, I use uh, in my coaching course that I teach. I, I talk about um, there's quite a few different ways of setting up brackets for tournaments. Uh, there's stopwatch timers where they can just have an iPad. There's scorecards. Um, so like I said, I could go, <laughs> I could go on and on. There's there's so many, which is why it deserves an entire presentation on, a, on itself, but I, I can tell you for all of those interested, if you get into your app store on whatever device you use, whether it's an a Android or an, an iPhone or any kind of Apple product, and you go in and you start Googling um, physical education apps or physical activity apps, um, I, I've also, in our health classes, we use the iMuscle app, we use all kinds of apps that help children start learning how to do exercises and it points to muscles and names them. So there's quite a few that will pop up and th that's where it's hard to talk about all of those because it's overwhelming and I don't want to overwhelm everyone. It's You start ba in baby steps and you pick a few and say this might be, be neat to try and once you get down how you're using it, then picking a few more becomes a lot easier to administer. Thanks, yes, Lisa. Um, yeah, those sound like really great. 
options. options for the classroom, and like you said, those are available for a, a minimal charge, or a lot of them are free too, so that, those are great resources. Um, the second part of that question was either games or some of the extra gaming that you had mentioned. Um, any favorites there? Uh, yes, Dance Dance Revolution um, seems to be uh, gender loved. So every every person in in the classroom, for the most part, will adapt to it. Um, so that seems to be a, a favorite, and you can use it not just for dance, but you can also use it for fitness. And a lot of teachers don't really like teaching the content of dance. So it allows them to work on teaching rhythm, let them be creative with steps they come up with, putting it on different modes. But you can also use it for fitness concepts. So it, it is something that you can buy that's not incredibly expensive and can be extremely durable, that, that can last for years in, in your classroom. Um, I, I, I really do like the Connect, um, Xbox Connect for, for also a, a more inexpensive way. You don't need batteries. You can display the TV, uh, the monitor up on the screen so all children are following, or you can use it in a station just where those students are, that are participating are actually getting recorded. And in some of the, the games like Just Dance, um, the, the class, um, I actually used it with my students where we would have like a brain break and go in and participate. And eventually, after you get so many points, you unlock uh, a, a new message or a new uh, prize. So it, dep it would depend on, you know, which class at that time could unlock that prize, and the kids absolutely love it. And another great thing about Connect is sustainability, which we know children get very sick of doing the same thing over and over and over again. So you're able to switch out the game. So you can practice, um, you know, some of my students, I've had them in elementary learn the, the rules of tennis or the rules of certain sports based on playing it. So they've got the cognitive aspect there, but then they're also able to go through the motions and work on the skills that we're working on in different stations. So you're able to use it for quite a few different applications. So that's why I really like that one as well. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, I think this brings up a, a really good point. We had a question that was submitted uh, while you're talking about apps. Do you think it's a good idea, do you recommend using the students and uh, assuming they are allowed in school, do you allow the students to use their smartphones in class if yeah, you're trying to incorporate some of the technology? So this is the, this is the question uh, across the world here. Um, some, some schools within a district may say, yes, you know, you can have your students bring their phones to the classroom and then you can assume that maybe some of them, some of the parents may not allow them to. But those students, I, I know my middle school student right now, he's not supposed to use his phone in school, but I know he takes it because he'll text me. And I'm like, turn off your phone. Like, what are you doing? So I know they have them. So if they're allowed to use them by permission by the principal, then, then yes, you would just have to make sure you're not you're not having them participate in something where they're holding it and running it around, running around, and, and the phone getting cracked. Um, that's the the thing of of trying to just make sure what they're doing with it, what you're administering, is is safe and not something that's going to cause any issues with with the parents. Great point. Um, and, and I had a, a really good question. The questions are flooding in, so thanks everyone for submitting these. We'll try to get to a few more. Um, the big thing that's coming up, I think a lot of teachers, this is a common theme, is classes getting pretty large. Do you use any applications or any technologies that help you facilitate a large class size? Is that something that you've had experience with, Lisa? Uh, I, I really have not, and it is such a common question. And unfortunately, I, I know what some people are thinking about as large being anywhere from 50 to over 100, 150, uh, quite a few students. And unfortunately, that's just incredibly impossible to handle and I think get everything accomplished that you want without a lot of teachers. And we're stuck with that and I realize that. That's where there would have to be multiple stations set up with, with different technologies it does get complicated, but I do not know of an answer right now 
that could get everyone together unless they participated more at the elementary level on something like uh, brain breaks, where you're able to put up on a large screen uh, an, an activity and they follow along and everyone has their own personal space. Um, that, that is something we've used with our larger classes in the gym. Um, Polar has a, a great thing that attracts attention, but once again, you would need heart rate monitors for it, where all the kids have heart rate monitors and you have a small space set out in, in the gyms where they rotate and you have a very small space to do different types of, of fitness component activities and they're able to look up on the board and see their heart rates and see where they're at at their, their fitness level. So it's really just a complicated question. Uh, and I, I wish there was something to solve that, but unfortunately a lack of space, uh, a lack of physical education teachers, and a lot of kids is a tough one. Definitely, and I think that's, uh, that's something that has come across as a, a common thread here. So I appreciate you addressing that one. Um, another one that just came up I, I think was a, a really good point. Is there anything that you use for students either sidelined due to illness, injury, um, that you'd like to get them participated in a lesson either in a modified way or anything for those students not able to participate for the day? I have not really focused on those. Technically an injury or an illness where their, their sideline would be more of the, the apps related, related to cognitive learning, to where they're actually still learning, uh, whether it's through um, different, different videos or something where they're actually able to watch, learn, and then regurgitate in some, some way or fashion what they've learned. Um, but being able to get students that are injured still active is kind of difficult because it would depend on the, the injury, and I, I, I haven't delved into that. That's a good question. Sure, lots of variables there. So thanks everyone again for the questions. We'll wrap up that section of the webinar here. Um, I, I did want to mention we've got our winner for the drawing, so I will announce the name. Um, it's Jeffrey Bradley. So Jeff Bradley, congratulations. We've got your email here, so we will be in contact on uh, when we'll be getting the prize out to you. We'll get that out to you as soon as possible. And uh, I'd also like to remind everyone just once again to keep an eye peeled for that certificate of participation for today's webinar. Um, as I mentioned before, it will be an hour worth of credit towards uh, educational credit. We will send that out. Uh, it's usually a few days, so keep an eye peeled here. Um, and then I, we just hope that you'd keep an eye peeled for the future webinar invites and you're able to join us for, for future topics. So appreciate everybody joining us today. And uh, thank you so much, Lisa. Great information. Everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.